gonna let, you're never gonna let me down. Found the replacement for oh, us. Oh, you're never gonna let, you're never gonna let.
Father, we thank you for this day, Father. You are the King of kings, the Lord of lords, the Alpha, the Omega, beginning and the end. With you in our lives, all is well. May the storm rage around us, Lord, not through us. Please join us in the, uh, the prayer above all prayers. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day. Please be seated. this morning. Lord, I just thank you for the gift of music with the ability to hear, to see, to touch and taste that you are good. May we continue on this path this morning, worshiping you in spirit and in truth. In Jesus' name, amen. Just a few announcements. I'd like to just ask Jane to come up for a moment and give you an update on what's happening with heading to North Carolina. Okay, so um, Chet and I will be heading to North Carolina sometime within the next two to three weeks. In the mean, to help with the hurricane relief there, it's just, as you all know, so completely and utterly devastated. Roads are still not open. People still have not been in contact with others. Um, they need desperately uh, items just to survive. So Chet's gonna be bringing his trailer um, and we want it loaded, folks. We want it loaded with all sorts of survival items for these people. Um, I got a few, um, if I can get this phone working here, <clears throat> ideas of what sort of things they need. Um, powdered milk, bottled water, baby formula and food, paper plates, plastic utensils, toiletries, hand sanitizer, baby wipes, diapers for both adults and children, and I could go on and on. There will be a list in this week's newsletter. I will also make a list available for out front for next Sunday. So there's a lot of items we need, and please let's fill up Chet's trailer and pray for us. Thank you so much. There will be more information again in the newsletter. If if other people are interested in going, should they still connect with you, Jane? Yeah. Okay. If they have big muscles, they can come. 
That's right. Okay, just a few other things. I want to draw our attention to uh, the prayer walk that Phil and Jane have created on their property. It's a, maybe a half a mile loop, uh, and you, I've been there. I've, I prayed over everything, and uh, you can pick up uh, when you get there. It's open to anyone to just go. You can take a stone that has a scripture on it, or, or Jesus, or the, the symbol of the fish, and you can hold that as you walk through, and there are scripture verses everywhere to meditate on. There are benches midway through, uh, like a third of the way through and another third of the way through that you can sit as long as you want. And just, it's just a beautiful space that uh, you can get away from, an, an, an oasis. So uh, talk to Jane or Phil for more details. Um, uh, I highly recommend it. If you walk one way, you'll read signs, but if you decide that you'd like to walk back and make it a mile loop, then there are more scriptures on the back of all of the signs that you can see as well. If you are visiting today, um, if you're not visiting today, uh, this card is for you. You can fill out a prayer request if you have a prayer request that's not urgent and doesn't need to be shared with the body. If you are new and you'd like to give us your contact information, uh, you can do that, fill this out, and drop it in the uh, offering plate when it goes by. Um, we invite everyone to join us for lunch. We have a lunch after every service, so please walk right down the hall and have lunch. Uh, I've been meeting now for a little while. Uh, on Tuesdays, coffee with Joe, Joe with Joe, uh, 10 o'clock in the office building in my office right over here. Jar's Cafe is supplying coffee for us. Uh, please uh, stop in. We're not looking to make it a, a club for people to just always come. Uh, we're, and, and that's not to say if you've been there multiple times that I have a problem with that. I'm just, the vision is that it's a drop-in time where you can not know that I'm there and uh, if we need to talk more, and there are people there, we can set up a time to talk. We have a prayer email address, so if you would like to fill out the card for prayer, you can do that. If you want to just send an email, you can do that as well. We've been adding uh, scripture to our morning prayer, but asking that the scripture verse that we choose each month that you integrate into your life, and when you say grace, when you have a Bible study, when when you are driving down the road, be thinking of this scripture verse and what we're working with this month is 2 Corinthians 5.20. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors, as though God were making his appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf to be reconciled to God. So what we want to do and what we're kind of teaching people to do is to take this verse and make it into a prayer, which is what we'll be doing uh, as we uh, go to prayer this morning. And we want to be praying for our extended church community. We put those names up as well. Um, are there requests? I, I do have the, uh, to be praying for the Fuller family and for, for, for Mike and, and those that have uh, really missing Gary. And this is a devastating thing to a lot of people in our community. His uh, memorial service will be next, this coming Saturday at 11 o'clock here at the church. Um, so we want to be praying for that. We want to continue praying for Father Joe at St. Joseph's, who's in need of a kidney, uh, for Laurie Jacobson and Donna with cancer. Cindy Green has been, uh, has been sick, and we want to be praying for her as well as Maria. Are there other urgent requests that we should be praying for? Yeah. Ted, thank you. Uh, yeah. On behalf of myself and Sue Gainley, we want to thank our church family for all the prayers that were for us while we were sick in the hospital. Uh, all the texts and the cards and the outreach and the visits and the food. Uh, it was absolutely amazing. We're so grateful. Thank you. Mm, and we're glad to see you both back. And, and you. And you both came back on the same day. Yeah, it's like, 
Don't do this again. <laughs> Be well together. <laughs> uh, and I saw it, Nate. My grandmother's in the hospital. She has a mass on her spine. Praying that there can be a biopsy done Monday. And she does not know the Lord. So just pray that that opportunity opens up. Thanks, Nate. Uh, yes and yes. Just continue prayer for Bob as he's healing after his surgery. He's having a hard time. And Lena? So I think we need to review cancer. Just in my own life, but in the last few weeks, we've been to three funerals, and there's one next week, and three of those four were all cancer. And we don't have people that could have had more years. So I just feel that we need to rebuke that illness, and I don't know what to do here. Amen. It's just rampant, I feel. Yeah. Thank you. Let's pray. Father, we once again offer these prayers in the spirit of worship as a community, as a family. We lift up to you the Fuller family and all those who are grieving. We pray over the service on Saturday that it would be a, a time of uh, of help, time of comfort, a time to, to help uh, heal. And we just pray over the family. And, and Lord, I pray for Mike as well. Lord, I pray for Father Joe and for his need for a kidney, for his health. Lord, we continue to pray for Lori Jacobson and for Donna and for all of those who are wrestling and, and dealing with cancer, we just pray, Lord, against that. We, we pray for the day that a cure is uh, revealed. Lord, we know there's a cure, uh, and we ask that it would be revealed for your kingdom, for your glory. We just pray for all of those in our, in our midst and, and outside of our midst that are devastated with this horrible disease. And we pray against it, Lord, in Jesus' name. And Lord, we continue to pray for Cindy and for Maria, uh, for their health, for their restored health, for their comfort as they are not able to be with us right now. And, we pray, Lord, for the family, the Stinson family, as they grieve the loss of Ted. We praise you for Elaine and Susan and for their return to us in worship. And we lift up to you Nate's grandmother, Ellen, for her salvation, Lord, that this is the moment that she would draw to you, that she would ask the right questions and hear the real answer. And we pray over this mass that is in her uh, body, on her back, that it would be treatable and that she would be made well as well. We continue, Lord, to pray for Bob and for his recovery from his procedure. And we just thank you for his ongoing, uh, resilient faith. And Lord, we pray. We pray that we would be your ambassadors, that you would make your appeal through us, that people would be reconciled to you in the name of Jesus Christ. We pray, Lord, for the remainder of this service as we look to your word, that it would penetrate deep into our hearts and souls, that it would penetrate through our joints and our marrow, that what goes out would not come back void, and that we would be changed by the power of your Spirit this morning through your Word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. 
Well, today we look at question two and three of these three questions that are posed towards Jesus. And we continue on in this Gospel of Luke. We've looked at the preformal history. I think it's important to continue to go over this, that, that, that you remember the segmentation even in uh, this Gospel. And so the preformal history, the Northern Galilean ministry, the journey to Jerusalem, and now in Jerusalem, moments of Jesus teaching in the temple. And what we had said was that this is bookended. This is bookended with uh, these two verses, the beginning of this teaching time in the temple and the end. In the beginning, we see he was teaching daily in the temple. And everything from that point to the end point and every day he was teaching in the temple that this is a bookmarked, a segment, a, a volume of a chapter, if you will, in and of itself. Uh, teaching in the temple. Today we look at two more trick questions. Questions uh, given to Jesus designed to trap him. Designed to trip him up. And, and so we're going to look at those today. But before we do, just to remind you, you know, we did this in more detail, but I just want to remind you that in chapter 2, Luke tells us of Jesus on a Passover festival going to Jerusalem. He's 12 years old. He gets left behind in the temple. And, and what we find in this preformal history, this second temple visit, he was brought to the temple when he was born. He's brought to the temple at 12 years old just before becoming a, a man by Jewish law. And, and he's left behind in the temple. And when he is, he is found after three days, and I think there's significance there, after three days, they found him in the temple, sitting among the teachers, listening to them, and asking them questions at 12 years old. And all who heard him were amazed at his understanding and his answers. So Jesus was asking questions, and Jesus was giving answers. He's 12 years old, and he's astonishing the religious elite found in the temple area. And I believe that many of them are still alive 20 years later, 21 years later, when he enters into the temple and flips the tables upside down and, and turns over the money changers and then begins teaching in the temple. And some of the same elites that were amazed at his questions and teaching are experiencing Jesus of Nazareth again. And so we go back to the temple teaching. And just to remind the setup, the context, Jesus entered Jerusalem on a colt, uh, an animal of peace. He didn't ride in on the horse that they expected, the animal of war. He rides in on a colt, but then he goes into the temple and he flips the tables and he turns over the money changers and, and he wouldn't answer their first trick question. If you remember, by whose authority do you do this? And he said, well, let me ask you a question. Was John's baptism from heaven or from man? And they can't answer it because it would be political suicide for them to answer the question. So they say, well, we, we don't know. And Jesus said, fine, I won't answer your question. And this is where we are. And then he told a parable. He told a parable about the tenants in the vineyard. And, and we talked about how as he's talking about a vineyard with a wall, he's probably pointing to the wall around Jerusalem. And when he's talking about the vineyard, there, there are grapes in gold on the doors, the size of a, the, the height of a man. And he's pointing to the grapes and, and the tenants. And, and he tells them that the tenants, the current tenants of the vineyard are going to be replaced that they are going to be discharged from their duties. And it tells us that they knew he was talking about them. 
And that's where we are. The tension, the anger, the desire to get rid of this thorn in their side. And so now we come to this passage of Scripture in Luke chapter 20, verses 19 to 47. And it breaks down like this. Should we pay taxes to Caesar? A very dangerous question, as we'll see. And Jesus responds to that question. And, th and then we see a question being raised about the resurrection. The Sadducees, first time they're introduced by Luke, the Sadducees did not believe that there was a resurrection. You died and you were gone. And they have a question about the resurrection to trap Jesus. And so Jesus responds again. And then Jesus has a question of his own. So he's being asked questions. He's asking questions. And we begin with this question of, should we pay taxes to Caesar or not? Here's what the text looks like. The scribes, the chief priests, sought to lay hands on him at that very hour, for they perceived that he had told this parable against them, but they feared the people. So this is how we ended the last time, but this is the beginning of this part of the story. This is a transitional verse that it ended with him telling this parable and and the religious elite knowing that he's talking about them and they're angered. He's told them they're going to be discharged. They're going to be replaced. And then we find this. This is their response because they're crippled. They can't do anything at that moment because of fear of the people. And so this is what happens. They, they watched him. They sent spies. They, they sent people into Jesus' midst that were going to be undercover, that were going to listen to what he said and agree with him and, and, and appear to be a follower. They're hiding. They sent spies who pretended to be sincere. We've all experienced those, the, the, the pretending to be sincere. And isn't that just aggravating? And Jesus understands and Jesus knows this. They're pretending to be sincere that they might catch him in something that he said. They're, they're listening to every word. They're watching everything that he's saying so that whatever it is, if he says the least bit wrong, that they'd be able to pounce on that. They're patronizing him to, to get him to feel as though it's safe. You can, talk about, you can talk about dangerous things among us. That they might catch him saying him something that he said so that they can deliver him up to the authority and jurisdiction of the governor. Pilate is the governor. And, and, and so what, what the plot is revealed, that they're, they're watching for something. They're going to do something for him to be somehow in offense with Pilate. And, and they're going to use Pilate as the, as the bad guy to come in and, and, and deal with this problem that they have of Jesus. And so they want to pull something that delivers him over to the authority and jurisdiction of the governor. So, Mark's gospel, in, in telling of this same story, gives us a little bit something added here. In Mark's gospel, in chapter 12, and they sent to him some of the Pharisees and some of the Herodians to trap him in his talk. The Herodians were Roman sympathizers. The Herodians and the Pharisees didn't agree. They, they were not friends. They were adversarial in the relationship that they had. And yet here, they're sending Herodians in, sympathizers with Herod, sympathizers with Pilate, 
Because right there, if they say something, if Jesus says something that could be offensive to Rome, the Herodians are right there to go straight to Herod and say, you'll never believe what this guy said. The Herodians are in this mix. Luke leaves that out, but we want to bring that in. And so they're seeking to find some kind of a solution by having him turned over to the governor. And here it is. So they asked him, teacher, we know that you speak and teach rightly and that you show no partiality to anyone, but you truly teach the way of God. You're our friend. We want to listen to you. We want your direction. We, we want your advice because we don't know what to do. Help us with this dilemma. We're safe. You can tell us. And here's the question. Is it lawful for us to give tribute to Caesar or not? Is it lawful? Is it lawful to the, to, to the audience? Is it lawful means is it biblical? Is it scriptural? It, does the Bible allow for this? Uh, is it lawful? And the other key word here, is it lawful for us? For all of us, is it lawful for us to pay taxes? Uh, paying taxes is no fun. I'm not thrilled about the taxes that I pay. This country was born out of the offense of of taxation without representation. What we hear on the political, you know, stump speeches is all about the taxes, often taxes. It's, it's a hot button topic today. And if you think it was hot today, imagine when it was being done by the oppressive Roman government, the tax collector system that extorted more money than was even necessary, and how the people were hurt. In fact, in fact, every male was in one of the taxes, one of the many taxes, every male in Rome had to pay one denarii tax every year. One day's wages, a denarii was one day's wages. Every year they had to pay that, in addition to all kinds of other taxes, but they collected a denarii for that. This, this question is now political, and it is dangerous. It's a dangerous conversation that they are invoking. In Acts chapter 5, uh, Luke writes about this person, Judas the Galilean. Judas the Galilean in A.D. 6 Judas the Galilean, when Augustus had the census that brought Jesus for, you know, to Bethlehem in, in Mary's womb, that census, the census was done to be able to collect tax. And this guy, Judas the Galilean, revolted. He revolted against it and he said that paying tax to Rome was idolatry and it was against the law of the Jews. Rome came in and crushed him and everyone who revolted with him. And that's what we find in this verse. After him, Judas the Galilean rose up in the days of the census and drew away some of the people after him. He too perished and all who followed him were scattered. Josephus, a Jewish historian, tells us more about that. But this is a very calculated trap. The people that are listening are the Herodians. The Roman sympathizers, they're in the audience. The people who are listening to the answer of this question are the zealots. 
There were a group of people, the zealots, who believed that battle and violence was the way to success. Uh, Barabbas, who was freed for killing somebody, was, was known to be perhaps a zealot. One of Jesus' disciples is a zealot. To say we should pay taxes to Caesar or not would perhaps put a price on their heads. Jesus would no longer be considered a solution to the zealots. They would, in fact, be thinking about how to take him out. He would be a Roman sympathizer. The zealots were listening. The Essenes, the Essenes, John the Baptist was believed to be an Essene. The Essenes are in the mix, and the Essenes are saying, let's back away from all of it. We don't want to associate with any government uh, at all, and they're looking to to step away, and the Essenes would perhaps walk away if Jesus said to pay taxes to the government. The Pharisees, they're already on his back and waiting and looking for every word. The, the Sadducees, who are now brought into this, aristocrats, their, their whole status, uh, their whole everything about their, their, their culture and, and the life that they're able to lead and wealth is all predicated on their alliance with Rome. The Sadducees don't believe in the resurrection. The Sadducees don't believe in angels. The Sadducees only look to the first five books of the Bible, the Torah, and that's it. The Sadducees are waiting to hear because they will separate from Jesus if he has the wrong thing. The tax collectors, think about how Zacchaeus, who we just heard about, who's giving half of his kingdom and and had dinner with Jesus. Imagine Zacchaeus if he's following along and he's there. And Jesus answers that we shouldn't pay taxes to Caesar. Imagine how Matthew and all of his friends, the tax collectors that are associated there, the the taxation, the taxation was considered by many to be uh, an offering to the emperor that was idolatry. Uh, taxation was problematic, the, the overbearing of the taxation, the occupation of Rome, the, the hatred towards Rome, and again, this, this idolatry. The coins, the coins had, uh, had the seal, of the image of Augustus on it, and the, and the coins said, to the divine Augustus. The coins had this. And, and so there's this calculated trap and a dangerous conversation, and here Jesus responds, and I can only imagine the silence, the anticipation, that pin drop moment. What is he going to say? And so he begins. He perceived their craftiness, and he said to them, Show me a denarius. Show me. It's an imperative. In the Greek, it's an imperative. He's demanding. Show me a coin. And and here's what we overlook when we see this, okay? Here's what we overlook. There's a problem here. There's a problem. The second commandment is to have no graven images, no, no false idols, no idols. When you enter into the temple, you had to go through a process of ritual purity. You had to walk into a mikvah and, and a baptismal, you know, bathing and, and wash yourself before you could enter into the temple. And the Roman coins, as I just said, had a divine image on them. And so they had money changers in the outer courts, in the Gentile, in the court of the Gentiles, they had money changers. Why did they have money changers? Yeah, I mean, people would come to the temple that had other currency from far, far away nations, but why did they have money changers? And the reason is they didn't allow Roman coins in the temple. So they had to, if they came into the temple with denarii, they were supposed to go to the money changers first and exchange them for a shekel equivalent. 
the religious elite had an exchange rate that they set. It was a tax, a hidden tax. They, they made money on the exchange of the denarii into the shekels. But the people, where is Jesus teaching? In the temple. He demands and says, show me, not a coin, show me a denarii. They had no business having one. They weren't sincere. It tells us they weren't sincere. They came into the temple to trap Jesus. They didn't come into the temple to lose money. They came into the temple with money in their pockets that was hidden. They came in with money in their wallets. And and so they asked this question to Jesus, and Jesus says, show me a denarii. And now the righteous, the people that are pretending to be righteous, their righteousness is in question with everyone around them. They're all looking and saying, that should have been dealt with first before before coming in here. Why do you have a Roman coin? And their wallet reveals their heart. And, and, and Jesus goes further. He perceived their craftiness and said to them, show me a denarii. Whose likeness and inscription does it have? I can only imagine the one that produced it. <laughs> the uncomfortableness. This, um, but it's Augustus, Caesar. Whose likeness and inscription does it have? They said Caesar's. They probably said Caesar's. <laughs> the, the, the guy in Rome. And Jesus said, give to Caesar. I think it's a better word to say give. Give to Caesar the things that are Caesar's. And to God the things that are God's. What is God's? What is God's? Jesus is talking about an image. He's doing this in the context where where they should be purging any image that is not sacred. What image remains in the picture if they give the coin away but their own? And they're made in the image of God. We are made in the image of God. And he's saying to them, give that. That image that you bear belongs to the one who is that image. That image that you bear, give that to God. That's his. I love this. And they were not able in the presence of the people to catch him in what he said. But they were amazed, marveling, not in a good way, but they were marveling at his answer. And they became silent. Jesus drops the mic. And again, they're marveling at his answers. And so, I think of this whole scenario as like the tag team wrestling. The, 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 the Herodians and the Pharisees, they're like, I'm out. They walk to the ring and they, they tap the, you know, the hand of the, of the Sadducees and they climb over the ring and, and they head in because the Sadducees have a plan as well. And it has to do with the resurrection. But before we can look at that, uh, and we're not going to go big into this, but the book of Tobit. So the book of Tobit is an apocryphal book. It's in the, what's called the Apocrypha. Uh, we, uh, in, in our church, uh, in our faith, do not see the Apocrypha as being scripture, but being good reading. 
It's not authoritative. Uh, the, the Catholic Church would say that it is authoritative. Some of your, some of your other uh, liturgical churches would say, and there's a whole line of story and reasoning behind that, but we're not going to go into that. I do not see the book of Tibet, uh, uh, Tobit as being scriptural, but it is good reading. It was written in the intertestament times. So between Malachi and between John the Baptist, this was written, and it was well-known. It was well-known literature. Uh, the Maccabees and the story of Hanukkah comes out of the Apocrypha. So in the book of Tobet, there's a, uh, Tobit, there's a story told uh, about Tobit's son, Tobias, and in parallel with that, there's a story, the story is told uh, about a woman, her name is Sarah, and, and Sarah has, uh, gets married, and on their wedding night before the consummation of the marriage, the husband dies suddenly. She gets married again, and on their wedding night, the husband dies before they can consummate the marriage. So, evidently word doesn't get out, but you know, she gets married a third time, and on the wedding night, before consummation, I'll stop saying that. All of them have that in it. Um, <laughs> dies. Yeah. <laughs> so, so he dies, and then she gets married a fourth time, and he dies. She gets married a fifth time, and he dies. She gets married a seventh time, and he dies. She eventually gets married another time and lives. But but that's a story that is very well known in the culture. And I would think, <laughs> I just don't think it's true because I just can't think that she would get past three. <laughs> um, four, four maybe, but I don't, you know, imagine when she does get married, the nerves of the, of the eighth. Um, and, and the book has more other stuff in it. I'm not going to go in but about the storyline, but I just want you to be aware that in the culture, there's a significant, well-known story of seven men dying and the woman not being able to conceive. Okay, so now the Sadducees, who do not believe in the resurrection, do not believe in that there's a life after death, they come up, and, and they've got their answer. They've got the answer that has stumped the Pharisees. They've got the answer that they know is the silver bullet. No one has ever answered this question before. And so they walk up to Jesus. There came to him some Sadducees, those who denied that there's a resurrection, and they asked him, saying, Teacher, Moses wrote for us that if a man's brother dies having a wife but no children, the man must take the widow and raise the offspring for his brother so that the family line doesn't disintegrate and end. And so the story of Tobit is seven different people, but here they, the story is morphed uh, and, and changed nuances to say that by the law, if... if the husband dies, the brother has to take the wife and produce heirs. And, and so here's their story. They've got it all figured out. So they say, now there were seven brothers. The first took a wife and died without children, and the second, and the third. And likewise, all seven left her with no children. And then uh, she also died. So there's seven wives, seven marriages, and no children. And, and they're tying this into this well-known story. And they're saying, <laughs> so if there's a resurrection, 
whose wife will this person be? In the resurrection, therefore, whose wife will the woman be? For the seven had her as a wife. You know, that's a good question. Uh, Annie and I celebrated 40 years being married a couple weeks ago. And uh, thank you. Um, and I, I couldn't imagine, I couldn't imagine being with anyone else ever. But, but if something happened to one of us, and, and we're told we're free to marry again if something does, when I hear this question, I'm thinking, if I die and she remarries, first thing I'm doing is taking her back. I mean, what would happen? I, I think it's a good question. But what the Sadducees are thinking is that they're thinking in a worldly sense, and, and heaven is bigger, deeper, wider than that. And so Jesus' response, moving quickly, Jesus' response is the sons of this age marry and are given in marriage. But those who are considered worthy, those who are considered worthy, those who are in Christ, as we build our theology as Christianity moves forward, but those who are considered worthy to attain that age and to the resurrection from the dead, they neither marry or are given in marriage. Marriage as we know it will end in heaven because we, the church, are the bride and we will be united in a marriage with Christ and somehow what we have experienced and have here will not be negated but will be complemented and more beautiful than we can imagine. We can't hold what it will in, is in store. And, and so there is, no, there is no concept of a I want her back or in, in heaven there will be some kind of a uniting marriage with the Lamb that will change everything and, 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 and will not negate the beauty that existed before across other marriages. It won't negate that. It will be complemented and beautiful. And I can't describe it more because I don't know. But Jesus tells us that it's something to look forward to, not something to step away from or to regret. For they cannot die anymore because they are equal to angels and are sons of God, being sons of the resurrection. Angels, they didn't believe in angels, and so he's throwing this in too. He's like twisting it all around. And, but that the dead are raised, even Moses, this is his answer, the dead are raised, even Moses showed in the passage about the burning bush where he calls the Lord the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And this is so wonderful how he's portraying this and, and defining that there is, in fact, a resurrection. And he's doing it where they've not found it. There's, there's talk about a resurrection in the other books. The Sadducees only look to the first five books. And so Jesus nails it right there in Genesis, right there. And he says, look, if Moses is saying, I am you... you you are the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, present tense, that you are their God right now, then there must be a resurrection because Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob are still alive. We see at the Mount of Transfiguration that very fact that Moses, Elijah, uh, appear at that tent. Now, he is not God of the dead, but of the living. If Abraham's gone, if he's toast and in the ground and there's no resurrection, then why is, he st why, why is God still the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob? And some of the scribes answered, 
teacher, you can just see the deflatedness in this. Teacher, you've spoken well. And they no longer dared to ask him any question. Silenced. And Jesus then has his own question. Don't go away. Don't walk away mad. Let me ask you a question. And here's his question. But he said to them, how can they say that the Christ is David's son? The Christ, the Messiah is to come through David. That would make the Messiah the, the subject to David. That the Messiah would be David's, uh, I'm going to say this right, that the Messiah would be uh, lorded over by David. For David himself says in the Psalms, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. David then calls the Messiah Lord. So if the Messiah is lorded over by David, how can David call the Messiah Lord? And they don't know what to say. And in hearing all the people, he said to his disciples, Beware of the scribes who like to walk around in long robes, who like to hide denarii in their wallet. Beware of them. Beware of them and their love greetings that aren't sincere in the marketplace. They look for the best seats in the synagogues. They look for places of honor, but they devour the widows' houses for the pretense and they make long prayers and, and they will receive a greater condemnation. He isn't backing down one bit. And we leave the, the, the storyline today with even more tension than when we started. But, but their goal, those that were sent in, their goal was to make it political. Their goal was to politicize Jesus' ministry and to make it political. And Jesus wasn't interested in making it political. He made it spiritual. Had he made it political, it might have suffered the same fate as Judas of Galilee. Had they made it political, it might have the same fate as what happened in 70 AD, just a, just a few decades later, where the entire temple and all of Jerusalem is destroyed by Rome. Instead, he made it spiritual. And by the year 300, all of Rome has embraced Christ. They tried to make it political. They tried to make Jesus look foolish. And doesn't that happen today? You know, I, I think when I talk with people about the gospel, they try to make it political. They try to make Jesus seem foolish. Uh, they try to cause division among his followers. They, this is happening even today. And the people that were doing all this were acting against the kingdom, and perhaps even some of them didn't even know it. So what does that mean for us, wrapping things up? What does that mean for us? What are you bringing into the temple? What kind of baggage are you bringing into his temple? They had rituals to cleanse themselves physically. But what are we doing to ensure that as a body and what we bring into the body is not harming the body? What are you bringing into the temple? What is, you know, to coin the phrase, what's in your wallet? What's in your wallet? Adulterous things, things that, that you wouldn't want Jesus to say, Show me what you got. What's in your wallet? Are, are you making the kingdom political instead of spiritual? Uh, what do you do when people see your faith as foolish? How do, how do you deal with that? Uh, are you allowing division in the kingdom? And what are you getting stuck on? The Pharisees were stuck on this whole idea of the resurrection. They weren't thinking in the kingdom. And, and, and lastly, how can you use a question to answer a question? I, I tell people this often. I mean, I get asked a lot of questions, and I should. Uh, 
I'm the person who has studied and, I, and I've been trained and I, if I don't have an answer, I should be able to get an answer. But not everyone has that. And, and, and how, do we, how do we deal with the times when somebody asks a question that we can't answer? And one thing that we as Christians can be better at is to ask a question too. Flip the table. Um, don't tell me you believe in the Bible. It's just a bunch of fairy tales making it foolish and calling you out on it. My general answer isn't to go into a proof text of how I believe the Bible is inspired. I can, but my response is usually, actually, I do. Uh, what do you use for a standard in your life? What do you use to determine right from wrong, good from bad? I, I hope you're not going to tell me I just feel like it's right because, man, that sounds dangerous. What do you use as a standard? Ask the question. Don't be afraid to flip things around. Uh, Jesus was the master at flipping things around. Um, how can you believe in a God that allows suffering? I would respond and say, how can we allow suffering? There is so much suffering in this world that we're responsible for. And, and what are we doing? What are you doing to eliminate suffering? You know, what's your ownership in that? Ask a question when a question is asked. Um, work on an answer, but don't be afraid to ask a question when someone asks a question because so often people just don't think. Uh, uh, I always tell the story of the contractor that started working when I was doing contracting in a consulting business that I had. I let, went out for lunch with him and I, and I want to enter into a conversation you know, with him. And, and he, we're, we're having all kinds of great conversation. And, and then he says to me, so how much consulting do you do? And I say, well, actually, I try to do as little consulting as I possibly can. You have a consulting business. I do. And you, and you want to do as little consulting as you possibly can? Yeah. Why? Curiosity, I'm very big on using curiosity. So he asked why. And I said, well, what I really like to do at this time, what I really like to do is hang out on college campuses and share my faith with college students. Everything changed. He's like angry. All of a sudden, he's got his fork and he's like waving it around and I'm afraid that I'm gonna be stabbed. He's waving his fork at me and he said, well, I just believe that people should keep their beliefs to themselves and not try to convince others what to believe. I answer a question with a question. I said, wow, didn't you just violate your belief system? He said, what? Didn't you just violate your belief system? Well, what are we talking about? You just said, I believe. That's a belief system. You said your belief was to keep your beliefs to yourself and not to try to convince somebody to believe differently or act differently. And yet you just told me what you believed and that you felt as though I shouldn't be doing what I'm doing. You're violating your own belief system by telling me that what I should believe and what I should do. How can you live with that? And he sat there for what seemed like minutes. And he said, you're right. If I really believe that people shouldn't try to convince people what to believe, I shouldn't be saying anything. You know, okay. He never thought about how ridiculous his statement was. We need to be good at flipping the question. Answer a question with a question. Jesus gives us some great examples in Scripture. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this entertaining uh, Scripture and yet pointed 
as well. We marvel at others being silenced. And yet, you have the ability to silence each of us. Forgive us for the ways that we act that are not sincere. Forgive us for the traps that we set. Forgive us for the, for the way in which we allow division to occur at the expense of your kingdom. Help us to answer questions effectively and not necessarily always with the answer. And, and help us to draw people into a relationship with you. By and large, the people in the temple courts were amazed at you. Amaze the people around us with your words and give us the courage and the, and the strength and the ability to be your ambassador, imploring people to be reconciled to you. For your kingdom and for your glory, in Jesus' name, amen.
Amen. Our closing hymn is 575. Please stand if you're able. Hymn 575, Leaning on the Everlasting Arms. Benediction from 2 Corinthians chapter 5. We, let's read this together. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors, as though God were making his appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. Father, we are your ambassadors, and you make your appeal through us. We want to implore others to be reconciled to you. Help us, guide us, direct us. Uh, may we be very involved in this ministry of reconciliation that you have given us. In Jesus' name, amen.